and my prediction, and this is a prediction, because it'll, it'll be 30 years, I won't be here, but one of the things about learning how to read, we have been doing a lot of consuming of information, learning through our eyes and so, it may be a very inefficient channel. So my prediction is that we are going to ingest information. You're going to swallow a pill and know English. You're going to swallow a pill and know Shakespeare. And the way to do it is through the bloodstream. So once it's in your bloodstream, it basically goes through it and gets into the brain. And when it knows that it's in the brain and the different pieces, it deposits it in the right places. So it's ingesting. The internet caused an explosion of innovation because it was built upon an open architecture. And just like the internet changed the way we communicate, programmable money is going to change the way we pay, allocate, and decide on value. So what kind of world does programmable money create? Well, imagine a world where I can rent out my healthcare data to a pharmaceutical company. They can run large-scale data analysis and provide me with a cryptographic proof that shows that they're only using my data in a way that we agreed, and they can pay me for what they find out. Instead of signing up for streaming services and getting a cable bill, what if my television analyzed my watching habits and recommended well-priced content that fit within my budget that I would enjoy? Imagine an internet without ads, because instead of paying with our attention when we view content, we just pay. Interestingly, things like micropayments are actually going to change the way security works in our world, because once we're better able to allocate value, people will use their money and their energies for more constructive things. If it cost a fraction of a cent to send an email, would we still have spam? We're not at this world yet, but it's coming. Right now, it's like we're in a world that is seeing the first automobile. The first cryptocurrency, like the first car, is slow and hard to understand and hard to use. Digital money, like the horse and carriage, works pretty well, and the whole world economy is built on it. We're entering a new era of programmable money. The new sharing economy is going to eliminate some jobs, but it's also going to create new, flexible forms of employment. I want to tell a story about two stereotypical American workers. And to make them really stereotypical, let's make them both white guys. And the first one is a college-educated, professional, creative type, manager, engineer, doctor, lawyer, that kind of worker. Uh, we're going to call him Ted. He's at the top of the American middle class. His counterpart is not college-educated and works as a laborer, works as a clerk, does low-level white-collar or blue-collar work in the economy. We're going to call that guy Bill. And if you go back about 50 years, Bill and Ted were leading remarkably similar lives. For example, in 1960, they were both very likely to have full-time jobs, working at least 40 hours a week. But as the social researcher Charles Murray has documented, as we started to automate the economy, and 1960 is just about when computers started to be used by businesses, as we started to progressively inject technology and automation and digital stuff into the economy, the fortunes of Bill and Ted diverged a lot. Over this time frame, Ted has continued to hold a full-time job. Bill hasn't. In many cases, Bill has left the economy entirely, and Ted very rarely has. Over time, Ted's marriage has stayed quite happy. Bill's hasn't. And Ted's kids have grown up in a two-parent home, while Bill's absolutely have not over time. Other ways that Bill is dropping out of society, he's decreased his voting in presidential elections, and he started to go to prison a lot more often. So I cannot tell a happy story about these social trends, and they don't show any signs of reversing themselves. They're also true no matter which ethnic group or demographic group we look at, and they're actually getting so severe that they're in danger of overwhelming even the amazing progress we made with the civil rights movement. And what my friends in Silicon Valley and Cambridge are um, overlooking is that 
their TED. They're living these amazingly busy, productive lives, and they've got all the benefits to show from that, while Bill is leading a very different life. They're actually both proof of how right Voltaire was when he talked about the benefits of work and the fact that it saves us from not one, but three great evils. So with these challenges, what do we do about them? The economic playbook is surprisingly clear, surprisingly straightforward. In the short term especially, the robots are not going to take all of our jobs in the next year or two, so the classic Econ 101 playbook is going to work just fine. Encourage entrepreneurship, double down on infrastructure, and make sure we're turning out people from our educational system with the appropriate skills. This guy at Facebook with drones and satellites wants to connect every single person on the planet. My friends at Google with Google loons and satellites and drones want to connect every single person on the planet. Paul Jacobs, Richard Branson, Greg Weiler have just raised a billion dollars to deploy OneWeb, a 648 satellite constellation in the next six years to connect every single person on the planet. And last week, Elon was announcing with SpaceX a 4,000 satellite constellation to connect every single person on the planet. So I want you to imagine in the next six to eight years, not five billion, but eight billion connected people. Not coming online like you and I did, right, at, on AOL at 9600 baud, right? <laughs> coming online with a megabit connection or better, with access to the world's information. We are about to see a massive explosion in innovation like we have not seen yet. Innovation coming from parts of the world that we would have never thought of. Five billion new thinkers. We're about to see an explosion in how we think and we connect, we communicate. This is Google's contact lens that's picking up glucose in your tears, which correlates to glucose in your blood. But that's the first step of sort of connecting to your neural system. There are amazing companies right now, like Colonel, a friend of mine, Brian Johnson, one of our benefactors at the XPRIZE Foundation, one of my investors, has launched $100 million to be able to connect your brain to the cloud. We're about to see, for the first time ever, an explosion in human intelligence. Brian talks about, it's not AI versus humans, it's HI. It's the most important asset we can ever have. It's the increase of human intelligence. I love this copy of Time Magazine, plugging in the brain into the cloud. But that's, that 2045 is not a right estimate. From the companies I'm seeing, Ray's estimate is by the early to mid-2030s. So imagine when, when you need additional memory capacity or a thousand times more intelligence, you can sort of like spool it up like your phone does on the cloud today. But by the way, the early 2030s, oh my God, that's 20 years from now. So what's the world going to be looking like? We heard about AI, whatever version you want from Hal to Siri to Google Now to IBM Watson. I prefer Jarvis. <laughs> I think we're all going to have a version of Jarvis. We'll be talking, you'll be listening, you'll give permission to your Jarvis, your personal software shell, to read your emails, watch what you're eating, listen to your blood chemistries, sort of listen to your conversations because it's giving you all the information you need just in time. And these AIs are also helping us solve the world's grandest challenges. On the Google stage last year, I was with the head of the Watson team from IBM on an XPRIZE and Amir, one of the co-organizers here, runs. And we're challenging teams to work with AIs to solve the world's biggest problems. We get frightened about grand challenges because we see them from far away. But guess what? The tools and technologies we have to solve these grand challenges is exploding onto the scene. That gives me the greatest hope for the future. AI is our most important tool ever to solve our grand challenges. But it's not just reading DNA. We can now write DNA. We can actually create novel life forms. You can design a life form on your computer, print out a string of DNA, put it into a blank cell, and have it boot up for life. And it's not just writing DNA. CRISPR-Cas9, and unless you buried your head in the sand, you probably have heard about CRISPR-Cas9, right? The ability to edit our own genomes, to have a disease and say, let's edit that away. Think about Word for your genome. Click, paste, repair. 
One of the implications that I'm focused on is extending the healthy human lifespan. Through genomics and stem cell science, my two companies, Human Longevity and Cellularity, our mission is to add 30 to 40 healthy years onto your life to give you the aesthetics, the cognition, and the mobility at 60, at 100 that you had at 60. And if you get that, we're heading towards a world of an indefinite lifespan. These are crazy ideas, but they're coming because the tools we have to enable them are accelerating faster than we could possibly know. I'm reminded, and we'll close on the notion that 400 million years ago, lungfish crawled out of the oceans onto land. Hasn't happened since. Today, we as a species are crawling out of the birthplace of humanity, this fragile planet, to the moon, to Mars, to the asteroids. A million years from now, whatever we've become, we're going to look back at these next few decades as the moment in time that we become an interplanetary species. I believe we have, during our lifetime, the next 30 years, the mission to inspire and to guide the transformation of the human species on and off the Earth. Something that I think people may be um, only beginning to look at uh, is establishing some kind of uh, brain-computer interface. Um, so a brain-computer interface? Yeah, at, at, the, at the neuron level. Um, so this is sort of intellig in, 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 um, uh, intelligence augmentation as opposed to artificial intelligence. Right. Um, and I think that, that, is, that has a lot of potential. Um, you mentioned to me this to me yesterday. I really had kind of no idea what you were talking about. And then I looked up Ian Banks. Neural lace. Neural lace. That's right. Exactly. And so it's this concept of you know wiring the brain. So it's either we could there there could be a brain internet, mm -hmm. and it could also mean that we can upload our thoughts to the cloud. You you would never forget anything. <laughs> you and you wouldn't need to take photographs. Yeah.